According to world-renowned geneticist Joshua Akey of Princeton University, at some regions in our genome, Europeans are more Neanderthal than modern human. Geneticists have found about 10 places in the human genome where Europeans inherited a beneficial Neanderthal sequence, and not surprisingly, many of these regions contain genes important to hair and skin biology. One example is BNC2, a gene known to influence skin, hair and eye pigmentation, and another is a gene for straight hair type. So European individuals at this place in the genome are more Neanderthal than they are modern humans. Indeed, it's clear that something about these Neanderthal genes was beneficial to our ancestors and helped them to survive in a colder environment. Homo neanderthalensis, a superhuman native of Europe's primeval forests, are sometimes referred to as our ancient brothers and sisters. The fossil was discovered in 1857, embedded in mud in a cave or fissure that intersects the southern rocky side of the ravine or deep narrow valley known as the Neanderthal. The Dussel River is a small stream or rivulet that flows along a narrow channel on one side of the valley, about 60 feet below the lowest point of the fissure. Scientists at the time report that human bones from an extinct race found in stalagmite, along with the remains of mammoths and other fossil animals, have long been known to exist in the limestone fissures or caverns of the lofty precipices that overhang the River Meuse in Belgium, about 70 English miles southwest of the Neanderthal. Furthermore, based on the data available, the Neanderthal skull appears to have also characterized the ancient, extinct race of the River Meuse, with the latter represented by a nearly perfect skull from the Engis Cave in Belgium. Neanderthals are arguably the best-known hominin species, aside from our own. Paleoanthropologists have a large number of Neanderthal individuals to study and interpret, as a result of their European presence and widespread burial practices. Interestingly, in addition to being the most well-known, Neanderthals were the first non-human hominin species named after fossils. However, the man responsible for the naming has been largely forgotten by history. The 33rd meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science took place in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. William King travelled from Ireland, where he was a geology and mineralogy professor, to give a presentation on Homo neanderthalensis, a new and ancient species of hominin. His announcement, first published in the pages of the Anthropological Review, among other publications, in 1863, would forever alter our understanding of human evolution. To understand William King's significance in the history of paleoanthropology, consider the first major hominin fossil discovered, the Feldhofer fossil, in 1856. In the early 1860s, knowledge of the strange Feldhofer fossil discovered in the Neander Valley spread to Britain. In 1860, English geologist Charles Lyell visited the cave where the fossil was discovered and returned with a cast of the cranium for study. Lyell gave the cast to anatomist Thomas Henry Huxley, who wrote about the skull in his infamous 1863 book Man's Place in Nature. Huxley argued that while the cranium appeared weird, with its large brow ridges and elongated shape, it was most likely within the normal range of variation in human skulls. Thus, Huxley saw the cranium as simply human, albeit in a primitive lower form. Although many naturalists agreed with Huxley, William King disagreed. For him, the idea that this thing could be considered human was absurd. In 1863 and 1864, King argued that because this cranium resembled an ape rather than a human, it should be classified as Homo neanderthalensis, a new species. This was significant because it was the first time a species of hominin, other than Homo sapiens, was named after fossils. Just let that sink in for a few seconds. King wrote that, Modern man's distinct faculties are visible in his elevated cranial dome, a feature that essentially defines the human species. However, given that the Neanderthal skull is eminently simian in both general and specific characteristics, King wrote, I feel myself constrained to believe that the thoughts and desires that once dwelt within it never rose above those of the brute. This was the first time a scientist had looked at a fossil and thought, this looks vaguely human but also very different so it must be another species. This was a watershed moment in the study of human evolution. And of course the name remains memorable today. 
It's also worth noting that King made interesting pronouncements on the fossil's intelligence in his claims that it couldn't be fully human. However, no human tribe, he wrote, extinct or existing, has both the vertex and the occiput so depressed and ape-like as the Neanderthal. Perhaps we would have experienced difficulty in believing that a human brain could have its posterior lobe so flattened and diminished as must have been the case in the Neanderthal man, he concluded. This is characterization of the stupid, brutish Neanderthal that we still haven't fully dislodged even today. Researchers have used the terms Neanderthal and Neanderthaloid to describe the same group of human specimens, and some fossils from Africa and Asia have even been referred to as African Neanderthals and Tropical Neanderthals. Meanwhile, Neanderthals from the Levant are sometimes referred to as Warm Neanderthalers, whereas classic European Neanderthals are referred to as Cold Neanderthalers due to their distinct anatomical differences. In fact, humans are tropical creatures. We spent the majority of our evolutionary history in warm climates, which may explain why so many of us spend the winter huddled under a blanket and daydreaming about summer. For the first time around 1.5 million years ago, hominins dispersed north into higher latitudes and encountered freezing temperatures, shorter days that limited foraging time, snow that made hunting more difficult, and icy wind chill that exacerbated heat loss from their bodies. Neanderthals evolved in glacial climates in western Eurasia between 400,000 and 40,000 years ago. In contrast to their forefathers, they had short, strong limbs and wide, muscular bodies that were ideal for producing and retaining heat. Despite their cold-adapted bodies, Neanderthals were still slaves of their tropical ancestors. This is because of our tropical heritage. We would be unable to live in cold climates unless we developed ways to deal with the temperatures. Humans' ability to adapt behaviorally was critical to their evolutionary success. Humans exhibit less physical climatic adaptation than other primates. Christian Bergman and Joel Allen were 19th-century biologists who are best known for discovering two rules that govern the body shapes of mammals. According to Bergman's rule, for varieties of the same species, body mass increases with latitude. Those living in cold climates will have compact, massive bodies, while those living in hot climates will have more linear body forms. It's simple physics. A sphere is the best shape for heat retention because it has the lowest surface area to mass ratio. Mammals are endothermic, which means they generate their own body heat. In cold climates, individuals with a more spherical body shape retain heat better, use less energy to maintain body temperature, and reproduce more effectively as a result. It's not just simple physics, but also simple natural selection. According to Allen's rule, mammals in cold climates have shorter limbs relative to their torso length than those in warm climates. Nonetheless, the tallest Neanderthal on record is the warm-weather Levantine Neanderthal known as Amud-1, with an estimated height of 180 centimetres and an estimated body lean mass of 75 kilograms, around 165 pounds, he would have been an absolute unit in his day. Indeed, the image of Neanderthals as a squat, chiselled brute is sometimes overstated, but Neanderthals had strong, muscular bodies, wide hips and shoulders, and the density of their bones, the width of their pelvis, and the thick areas of muscle attachment indicate that they were a very muscular group. Humans are master adapters, thriving in almost every ecological niche imaginable. Because the arms and legs are narrow and linear, they lose heat faster than the torso. Therefore, shorter arms and legs lose less heat than long arms and legs. Modern humans follow both rules. For example, the Inuit of northern Canada have short, compact bodies with relatively short arms, whereas Sudanese in tropical Africa are tall and thin with relatively long arms and legs. Neanderthals also adhered to these rules. They developed a traditional body type for heat retention, relatively short and compact, with short arms and legs. Neanderthals were more likely to have been ambush hunters, relying on sudden explosive speed and power to overcome obstacles. Their leg proportions, ligaments and tendons, as well as their genes, made them designed for short bursts of speed. Unlike the open African plains, the early landscapes in Europe were more densely forested. 
In addition, evidence from Neanderthal ankles backs up claims that Neanderthals couldn't run as fast as modern humans could. Their heel bones are longer than modern humans, resulting in a shorter Achilles tendon. Homo sapiens is the only hominin species that evolved in a tropical environment. On average, Homo sapiens from the tropics have a longer reach and longer strides than Neanderthals. Whatever the case, according to a study of Neanderthal and early modern human hand bones, upper Paleolithic Homo sapiens had higher inner robusticity of the medial phalanges than most Neanderthals. Some Neanderthals, on the other hand, descended from both Denisovans and early anatomically modern humans before migrating to Siberia. Extreme phalangeal robusticity, therefore, could be a legacy of early anatomically modern humans, according to the report. According to paleogenetic studies, the Altai Neanderthals of the Denisova caves are partially descended from Homo sapiens, who lived more than 100,000 years ago. In point of fact, these Neanderthals were had up to 20% archaic Homo sapiens genes from the tropis. In short, some Neanderthals have adaptations inherited from tropical modern humans. This differs from our perception of Neanderthals as only cold-weather species and Homo sapiens as tropical species. Furthermore, according to Russian scientists, Neanderthals were characterized not only by peculiar biomechanical adaptations, but also by a specific hormonal condition which has no close parallels among modern human hormonal conditions, either normal or pathological. Neanderthal males were likely stomping around with testosterone levels two or three times greater than the average man today. This condition could have evolved as a result of inherited genes, life in an ice age climate, and an all-meat diet. In fact, many Neanderthal skeletons have stab wounds, including Shanidar III, whose lung was most likely punctured by a stab wound to the chest between the eighth and ninth ribs, and other signs of trauma, such as blows to the head. The predominance of brawn over brain among Neanderthals may also be reflected in the number of skeletal injuries seen in both sexes, most likely from close-range hunting. Their diet consisted nearly exclusively of proteins and lipids, which must have influenced their hormones and bone growth. One final chilling fact. Around 42,000 years ago, the world experienced a few centuries of apocalyptic conditions caused by the reversal of the Earth's magnetic poles and changes in the behavior of the sun, according to a multidisciplinary study published in Science. One noticeable effect for those living at the time, including Neanderthals, would have been the spectacular display of auroras, which are typically confined to polar regions but may have been visible at lower latitudes due to the weakened magnetic field during the reversal. Aside from the stunning auroras, the pole reversal could have triggered changes in weather patterns. The altered magnetic field could have influenced atmospheric circulation, leading to shifts in climate and weather phenomena. Neanderthals, who were accustomed to the specific environmental conditions, may have struggled to adjust to the new climatic patterns, affecting their hunting and foraging strategies. This most recent major geomagnetic reversal triggered a chain of dramatic events with far-reaching consequences for our planet. This was like a horror movie plot. The ozone layer was destroyed, electrical storms raged across the tropics, solar winds produced spectacular light shows, auroras, Arctic air poured across North America, ice sheets and glaciers erupted, and weather patterns shifted dramatically. Aurorae, which are normally limited to the polar regions, would have spread throughout the world. The ionized air would have served as an excellent conductor for electrical storms, increasing their frequency. During the event, the Earth's magnetic field weakened to zero to six percent of its normal strength, and our cosmic radiation shield was completely gone. According to these scientists, the skies would have been illuminated by widespread auroras as a result of the magnetic reversal which contributed to many earthly extinctions. Solar flares and galactic cosmic rays ripped apart particles in Earth's atmosphere, ionizing the air and depleting the ozone layer. Our ancient brothers and sisters would have witnessed incredible light displays across the sky both day and night. Neanderthals, with their keen observational skills, would have witnessed these awe-inspiring lights in the northern night sky. The vibrant colors and dancing patterns of the auroras may have been both fascinating and perplexing to these early humans, possibly even inspiring myths and legends. And with that tantalizing statement, 
we leave you to ponder the mysteries of our shared human history. Until next time, stay curious and stay questioning. And before you go, please subscribe, share and explore our channel's other videos. Thank you and take care.